This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Before we get the program started today, I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us from remote locations over the Internet. Thank you for being with us again. In just a moment, the youngest member of the Kennedy family to hold public office, former Congressman Mr. Patrick Kennedy, will be joining us to take a look at an area of health care reform which is often swept under the carpet. Psychiatric disorders such as PTSD, addiction, Alzheimer's, and bipolar disorder. Are we prepared to take on lifelong treatments and How close are we to finding cures for these conditions? But before Mr. Kennedy joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Patrick Joseph Kennedy II was born in Brighton, Massachusetts, the youngest child of Senator Ted Kennedy and Virginia Joan Bennett Kennedy. He earned his undergraduate degree from Providence College in 1991. Kennedy became the youngest member of the Kennedy clan to hold an elected office when at age 21 he was elected to the Rhode Island House of Representatives. Then in 1995, Kennedy was elected to the United States House of Representatives, where he served until 2011. During that time, Kennedy was known for his health care advocacy. He was one of the chief sponsors of the Mental Health Parity and Addictions Equity Act, a landmark bill which required public and private health insurance plans to provide coverage for mental illness that was comparable to coverage for physical ailments. But his crusade against the stigma and unfair treatment associated with mental illness was just beginning. Kennedy has been the recipient of awards from the Society for Neuroscience, the American Psychoanalytics Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and numerous other national organizations. In 2008, Mr. Kennedy chose to share his own struggles with undiagnosed bipolar disorder and drug and alcohol addiction with the public. And we're going to hear more about that decision later in the program. Today, Mr. Kennedy is the co-founder of One Mind for Research, Project SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, and the Kennedy Forum. He also serves as an advisor to the American Psychiatric Association and the National Council for Behavioral Health. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, advocate for mental health reform and former congressman, Mr. Patrick Kennedy. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Kennedy. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for uh, doing this program. Now, I I was thinking about this a lot uh, because this is a very important subject and I want to do justice to it. So I thought maybe a good place to open today's conversation might be to explain what the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act is and why you felt it was so necessary. Well, thank you. Um, So the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act basically says that you treat illnesses of the brain like you would treat illnesses of any other organ in the body. So, for example, uh, right now, mental illnesses, the most notable ones, schizophrenia, bipolar, addiction, for example, um, we treat them only after they become a crisis. In other words, until it's a really severe illness. Uh, To compare it to diabetes, um, we wait to treat someone with severe mental illness and addiction until uh, the equivalent of when they need to have, if they were a diabetic, they would need to have their legs amputated or they went blind from their diabetes. That's currently how we treat mental illness and addiction. We wait until it's, you know, well past time to treat it. To compare it to cancer, Um, The way we treat people uh, who have addictions and mental illness, we would essentially say to them, come back and wait until you have stage four cancer before we treat you. And that's the way we reimburse currently for care for the brain, for illnesses of the brain. So um, what uh, what the legislation that I had the chance to uh, sponsor said simply was that if you treat diabetes, you know, prophylactically, in other words, early and try to prevent its, um, you know, worse complications, or if you treat cancer by doing early screenings, you know, to catch cancer early and treat it early, if, even if you have cardiovascular disease, of course, we know about the drug Lipitor and, 
you know, anti-cholesterol med- medication that many of us take. In fact, we take 20 years before it's likely that we would have a stroke or a heart attack. Um, why don't we apply that same concept of prevention towards illnesses of the brain, especially now since we know so much more about how to provide for early identification and diagnoses of these uh, severe mental illnesses and addictions. That's right. Uh, We know a lot more than we used to know, and uh, there's no reason we can't be preemptive. Now, the last thing I want to do on this program is alarm listeners. But when it comes to mental illness and addiction, to, to be honest, we have a bit of a pandemic on our hands, don't we? Well, it's always been there. But uh, we're recognizing the costs. We, we recognize the fact that, uh, you know, so many people with addiction to mental illness are in our prison system today. We know so many are homeless. Um, you know, we're paying for these untreated illnesses. And, of course, the most significant way we pay is the suicide rate. Uh, 38,000 Americans uh, successfully complete Uh, taking their own lives every year. And, of course, amongst our veteran community, uh, the number is is shocking. It's uh, it's hard to to quantify, but we know that it's it's over uh, 20 veterans a a day. Um, It's just something, whatever number, it's too many. And there's so much more we could do to prevent these um, tragedies, which are the ultimate uh, sign of our failure to a tr- a tr- address mental illness and addiction, is that we we wait till they become such criti- critical illnesses. Well, as you point out, the statistics are a- available on the internet. The latest report is that one million people in the United States report attempting to commit suicide each year. Yeah. It, it, this yeah. is when I say it's pandemic, it's pandemic. And we now have, uh, you know, antidepressants jumping 400 percent between 2005 and 2006. And the largest jump is amongst preschoolers and adolescents. Now, if ever an alarm bell ought to go off, that ought to be it, shouldn't it? Well, clearly, uh, we have to do a lot more um to support our young people in helping them cope with the life stresses. And, of course, so many young people are are growing up in really uh, challenging times. And, of course, for, you know, young teenagers, young adults, it's enormously challenging. Our economy has been uh, devastated and and still slow to pick up. And, And the prospect of people being able to get a decent job and have a home and provide for a family are more daunting now than they've been since uh, the worst days of the depression, frankly. I mean, for young people to try to get jobs today, it's very, very challenging. So we we have to understand the enormous stresses, and I, I think we need to do a much better job at helping people develop uh, the, those coping mechanisms, the resiliency. And unfortunately, and what we're doing instead is we're marketing you know, all kinds of drugs to them as quick, easy solutions to their anxiety and depression. And I don't think that uh, should be our first order of defense. I think we ought to be being much more open-minded about how we develop a people's uh, emotional life and uh, they need to get support and we need to understand what kind of support helps people. Obviously, connection to family and friends, being involved in your community, Um, We say these things, but, you know, people are tied up, they're busy, they're on their phone, they're on their computer. There's not a lot of human interaction which can lend itself to that kind of support when you need it emotionally because people are are running too fast these days. And it's no wonder people are are stressed um, and anxious and, and depressed. Absolutely. You take the stress of the economy, you take being isolated, and then yeah. you take a, a philosophy of using drugs as a coping mechanism. Yeah. And uh, and then you wind up with the statistics that we have today. Now, we yeah. have to take a short break, but stay right where you are. When we come back, we're going to talk about where all this mental illness is coming from. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data 
and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. Greetings, folks. This is Randy the Realtor, just letting you know of a spectacular new listing on the outskirts of Watsonville. For $650,000, you can live in a beautifully finished home with wonderful orchard and mountain views, a kitchen with four ovens, two dishwashers, and granite countertops. If you're looking for a top-notch, move-in-ready home, this is for you. Call your realtor or call me, Randy the Realtor, at 831-566-2590. Or visit my website at aptoshomefinder.com. Hi, this is Ethan Behrman, a host on the ZBS Radio Network. And I'd like to introduce you to the all-new ZBSRadio.com. ZBS Radio brings you a variety of talk radio programming on subjects like health and nutrition, politics, personal finance, gardening, pet care, technology, and so much more. At ZBSRadio.com, you'll find podcasts as well as live and on-demand streams of exciting and informative talk radio programming that's available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your computer or mobile phone. Listen on the web using our streaming player or in your iTunes or other listening software. Also, be sure to check the app section of our website to find mobile apps that make listening to your favorite shows even easier. Check the shows page at zbsradio.com to see our current lineup of shows. New shows will be added all the time. Thank you for listening to the ZBS Radio Network. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm Steph. I'm Rob. From Out in Santa Cruz. Listen Saturday at 7 p.m. as we bring you the news of the week and talk to the Queer Youth Task Force about the upcoming Queer Youth Leadership Awards. Check us out on Facebook.com slash Out in Santa Cruz. Follow us at Out Cruz and listen to past episodes at OutInSantaCruz.com. We'll see you on Saturday at 7 p.m. on KSEO 1080 AM. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is mental health advocate and former congressman, Mr. Patrick Kennedy. And before the break, we were talking about the rise in mental illness, addiction, use of antidepressants, and the increase in the stresses um, that we now know are, are the ingredients which can lend themselves to cognitive and behavioral dysfunction. So let, let's talk about the fact that for the first time in all of human history, we can now look under the skull and observe what mental illness looks like in the brain. Can you speak about the role neuroscience is playing in helping remove the misunderstandings we, we've had about mental illness? Well, obviously, we can, uh, we've never been able to explore the brain like other organs of the body. But um, 
now through advanced uh, imaging, uh, through uh, other tools, <clears throat> frankly, like you know these supercomputers. You've just heard your one of your advertisers for the program, IBM. You know you have Watson is trying to uh, decode you know kind of algorithms that occur not only in in helping to determine market research, but research into the most important computer of all, and that's the computer in our brain. You know, it's it's really a, an unprecedented time for opportunity for understanding this organ that's the most important organ in our body. It's really what makes us who we are as, as human beings, as people. And, and the complexity of our brain is such that it's going to take this kind of supercomputing for us to really understand. Um, obviously, we have stem cell research and a bunch of other tools at our disposal. So, and with genetics, there is a complement of, of tools that will allow us to understand how to better treat these intractable illnesses. In the past, because it was so difficult to treat, we really were, looked the other way because it was too big a challenge. Now we can meet that challenge. So if these issues are now being recognized as medical issues, and they're not looked upon as, as moral issues. Because when people behaved in a certain way, we thought that was a, a matter of choice. And, uh, and sometimes obviously. character. We, we thought it was yeah. a lack of character. <clears throat> you know, it was looked upon as character, not chemistry. Yes. Now, obviously, there is a certain amount of, of more moral decision-making that we make that could lead to uh, chemistry being off. If you, uh, and frankly, there's, we have to really understand these uh, illnesses from a lot of different perspectives. But you know, I know that there are people who are, are good people. You know, my mother, for example, arrested for, uh, for DW, DWIs. I knew that she never intended it because it was so humiliating and shameful for her. And, um, you know, this is not something she would choose. My mother has severe, intractable depression and, and really severe alcoholism. She lost her mother to alcoholism. You know, it shouldn't have been a surprise that I would have been a candidate for alcoholism and depression. It ran in my family. But my physicians, when I was growing up, never bothered to check. In other words, we do not do a checkup from the neck up when we do our, our physician visits. And it's pretty surprising to me with the rate of, of suicide and the rate of addiction and the rate of mental illness that we do not uh, train our physicians and we do not incorporate in our healthcare system a mechanism to try to identify who is at risk for addiction, depression, anxiety, and the like. Um, and that, I think, is, is about to change, hopefully because of the law I had a chance to write, which requires that whether you're inpatient, in-network, or outpatient, in-network, inpatient, out-of-network, or outpatient, out-of-network, or in you're in the ER, or whether you need um, pharmacy benefits. These are the six categories of care that we defined as having to be analogous to the treatment of other chronic illnesses. So if you treat asthma or diabetes or cardiovascular disease in these ways as chronic illnesses, which we do today, um, we need to treat schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, substance use disorders, in a similar or analogous way across these, uh, you know, buckets, if you will, within the insurance system. Yes, and I think you bring out a, uh, an important point. Uh, if you know you're at risk for breast cancer, colon cancer, any, any other diabetes because of your genetic inheritance, not through lack of character or not yeah. eating right or exercising, just through your genetic inheritance, you can have a pr higher risk or, or be in a lower risk group. And uh, and I think it's very important to know that information early on so that you can take uh, steps to safeguard against that. It seems very logical, very reasonable, and yet when it comes to uh diseases of the brain, we just don't seem to have our act together in early prevention and preemption. Now, just last year, President Obama launched a program to map the human brain, a groundbreaking project, which is expected to have the same kind of impact that mapping the human genome had on medicine. I take it you feel this was a, uh, an important step. An important step. Um, 
However, I do believe that we need more presidential leadership on this issue. Frankly, this is on the order of, uh, you know, more of the Manhattan Project, you know, um, the, the, it's, it's on order of a national security issue. When you look at the rates of Alzheimer's, uh, autism, addiction, you look at the rates of Parkinson's, MS, everything, a traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress of our returning veterans, mm -hmm. you, frankly, it's shocking to me that this nation does not have a more organized effort to understand and treat illnesses of the brain because, you know, Alzheimer's is not just one area of the brain. It, you have to understand the whole brain to understand how to better treat Alzheimer's. And frankly, traumatic brain injury contributes to dementia, Alzheimer's, and frankly, intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, like Down syndrome uh, have dementia as a symptom. In other words, from childhood to old age, these are illnesses that affect all Americans, and it's shocking to me that we don't have a bigger effort, both on the government side and, of course, on the private sector side. Part of the reason the private sector doesn't step up is because the government uh, has not aligned the incentives such as to really encourage private sector investment to meet the need. Of course, the market is out there. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you look at the demographics and the, and the burden of illness from, from brain illnesses, it's out there, but we need to facilitate a better process by which we can get private investment into discovering how the brain works and how to better intervene to make sure it works better. Yeah, it, it's interesting that we treat this certain illness differently than any other organic illness, and and our even our the response of our leadership uh, is uh, is is unorganized and rather anemic, uh, as you point out. And I can hear the passion in your voice that uh, certainly the market is out there. There are growing numbers of individuals with Alzheimer's and with other kinds of challenges, mental challenges. And so this isn't a question about whether there are enough people uh, that would benefit from such a program. Now we have to take another break. Uh, stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Patrick Kennedy. You're listening to the Costa Report. One of my new customs is to put open bottles of red and white wine on my table so my guests can serve themselves. But not just any wine. In my home, I want to serve the best, and that's wine from Caraccioli Cellars. So this year, I asked winemaker Scott Caraccioli for a suggestion on what I should serve. Come dinner time, it's always a good idea to have a bottle of nice Chardonnay as well as Pinot Noir on your table. That way you have a selection for every guest that walks through your door. But the best way to start the evening is definitely with a bottle of bubbles, preferably Brut Rosé, to really get the celebration in, in the mode of the holidays. Oh, you're absolutely right. It's, there's something about the bubbles that gets everybody going. Yeah, it's really a, an infusion of happiness. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So I'll start with the bubbles and then move on to the red and white on my table, and then I'll have everyone covered. Unless people want to keep going with the bubbles, which I always advise. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Scott. This is Lindsay Britton, and I'm hosting the 32nd Biannual Coastal Cleanup Santa Cruz, hosted by the Cabrillo College Oceanography Division. Join us Saturday, May 3rd, at the KSEO radio station on Portola from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Free food and drinks sponsored by Whole Foods, Santa Cruz Coffee Roasting, and more. Live raffle and auction, live music featuring Plowman, all proceeds benefiting the Clean Oceans Project. Bring your own mug and join the auction or donate at biddingowl.com slash capital T-C-O-P and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Cabrillo. Beach cleanup. Hello, I'm Camilla Blutian with the Santa Cruz County Chapter of the American Red Cross. Here in Santa Cruz, we know that heroes walk among us every day. We admire them for their courage and dedication as they give willingly and ask for nothing in return. Here at the American Red Cross, we believe in the gift of giving, and it's time to give thanks to our local heroes. 
Join us as we raise our glasses in a breakfast toast to the local heroes who have made a difference in our community. Let's celebrate together on Wednesday, May 14th from 7 to 9 a.m. as the American Red Cross recognizes our local heroes for their extraordinary acts of courage and community service. It's the 2014 Heroes Breakfast, May 14th from 7 to 9 a.m. We're at the beautiful Coconut Grove Ballroom, toasting our local heroes over a delicious breakfast. That's May 14th from 7 to 9 a.m. Get your tickets by May 7th at redcross.org Santa Cruz. Join us as we celebrate our local heroes. Those who say you can't have your cake and eat it too haven't driven a new Ford C-Max or Fusion Energy plug-in hybrid. Hi, I'm Elliot Geis over here at North Bay Ford in Santa Cruz. You can have the best of both worlds with our new Ford Energy hybrids. You can have the ultra-fun driving pleasure of cruising around town on the electricity stored in the energy state-of-the-art lithium-ion battery. Then, after 20 or so miles, you can switch the energy's hybrid engine and drive another 600 miles. So you see, you can not have your cake and eat it too when you drive a new Ford C-Max or Fusion Energy car right off the lot at North Bay Ford. But don't take my word for it. Come on down to North Bay Ford and test drive a C-Max or Fusion Energy today. The best deals of the year on new energy cars are ready to roll here at North Bay Ford. You can have your cake and eat it too. Ford plug-in hybrids give you the choice of cruising around town on pure electricity stored in the car's lithium-ion battery or switching to hybrid mode and driving another 600 miles on a single 12-gallon tank. Come on down to 1999 Soquel Avenue, Santa Cruz, or on the web at NorthBayFord.com. It's It's the the way way of love love, live. live. The variety show committed to bringing you positive stories and life-affirming messages. Combined with enough inspirational music and satirical comedy to make it worth everyone's while. Together we focus on the most important issues of the day by exploring informed and enlightened approaches wherever we can find them. Using serialized fiction, we bring to life great stories from the past and sci-fi possibilities of the future. Join us every Saturday, 5 to 7 p.m. for It's the Way of Love Live. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today we're speaking with former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. And in the early segment, uh, you were talking about the need for greater leadership and an integrated, organized plan on how to bring the preventative treatment of mental illness into parity with the treatment of other physical ailments. Now, it wasn't until 2008 that you decided to share with the public your own struggle with bipolar disorder and drug addiction. Can, Can you talk about what led to that decision? Well, actually, um, I uh, had a chance to speak about it publicly back in 1996 as a newly elected member of Congress. Tipper Gore, uh, you know, then uh, obviously Vice President uh, Gore's uh, um, wife came up to Rhode Island, a big mental health advocate, and I spoke about my uh, struggles as well. Um, I had already been in rehab before I was elected to Congress, and frankly, in my first election to Congress, my opponent made that a campaign issue, and uh, my constituents still voted me in, and I kind of felt obliged to continue to work on that issue because they supported me because they wanted me to work on that issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was, because it's a chronic illness, um, obviously it's never, like, cured, um, I had, um, you know, recurring uh, bouts of uh, my addiction and, and depression. And so I was in rehab a couple of times, even while serving. I, I was uh, uh, arrested um, for a DWI um, in uh, 2006. And um, obviously my um, many people called for me to resign at the time. I went to, to treatment. I came back and... I decided to talk more about, you know, what I was trying to do personally, but also politically. Yes. In the following election, I I received the highest, uh, uh, my highest vote totals of all my political career, which kind of uh, both was a shock to me, but you can imagine the shock to my political advisors who had told me not to talk about being in recovery and, and, and the incidences like the arrest that had led me into uh, treatment again. Um, When I went out and talked about it, whether it was to a senior center or to um, a rotary club, 
you know, the, the fact that I started the conversation was something of, of real relief to my constituents. I had more of my constituents wanting to, to talk to me about their own family issues as a result. And ironically, after my reelection, it was in the next session of Congress that I finally uh, was able to pass the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, and so how ironic that my constituents uh, re- reelected me, and it was the following session of Congress that we were able to ultimately pass the bill. And it was passed by many of my colleagues who um, opened up to me about their own issues, um, you know, once I had faced such a public kind of um, humiliation um, myself in, in, uh, in terms of my um, addiction and mental illness. So, you know, in, in these days, I see these things as part of, you know, God's plan, not mine. You know, when you're in the middle of it, you can't really often see, uh, you know, what the purpose of it is. But obviously today, I, um, you know, th- things are much bigger than, uh, than w- we ever can appreciate. So how difficult is it for a person who's serving in public office to even seek help? I mean, does it mean putting your job on the line? We all remember what happened to Thomas Eagleton. And and that was a shameful period in our history. Yeah. Well, you know, it's true for all Americans. I mean, I was not unique. Uh, You know, I had um, well-known business people, well-known media people in my state and, and, frankly, across the country who told me about their own secret struggles. Now, the, the, the defining characteristic of this is that people suffer in silence. The defining characteristic is that they are, um, you know, they want to keep it a secret. And frankly, keeping these things a secret uh, makes us sicker, you know, in, in my... But that's part of the program. stigma. Isn't that supporting the stigma when you say, listen, if I have a broken arm or leg, that's different, but mental illness should be kept a secret. Yeah, no, it's uh, there's a phrase, you're only as sick as your secrets. And, um, you know, the way to get into recovery is to acknowledge your challenges. And and it's difficult because the, the discrimination, i.e. the stigma of having a mental illness is very real. And as much as we talk about it, like, you know, on this show and everything, it's still very difficult for people to acknowledge. I can't say that I did this voluntarily, frankly. Uh, I I was outed. In other words, I had to face the music because I was a public official and I was arrested. Now, you know, it's hard for you to deny the impact of your illness when you're, you know, reading about yourself on the front page in the newspapers. Oh, Uh, I don't know. There's a lot that still deny it anyway. You know, it's true. Um, But, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like for many people, if they can just function or in other words, they can just get by, Mm -hmm. they kind of feel like they can manage. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this just just doesn't end well ever until we get, you know, some help. You know, we we end up uh, hurting ourselves or hurting someone else. And, uh, you know, we're often we end up in uh, mental institutions or in jail. So, Well, I, I uh, have something to say to anyone who's listening to this program today. If you, if you are struggling with addiction or some mental illness and you think you're not hurting anyone, you just don't know who you're hurting. No. Well, another defining characteristic of having a mental illness or addiction is that you don't appreciate the degree to which your illness affects other people. Yes. And so not only don't you understand the, the uh, severity of your own illness, um, yourself, but you don't understand how it's impacting everyone around you. Um, that is a, a defining characteristic. Now, one of the points that you've made is many of these illnesses, they require lifelong treatment and oversight and constant management. And with yes, record right. numbers of people struggling with mental illness and addiction, uh, how are insurance companies and the Affordable Care Act, how can they handle these costs? So there are, you know, like I said, I've been in and out of like detox and rehab, you can either pay for that or you can have an insurance system that pays for the kind of monitoring and preventive care or primary care that keeps you out of being re-hospitalized. And so the whole goal of trying to change our system from being a sick care system to a health care system is that we realign the incentives to try to keep people out of very costly 
treatment environments. And frankly, um, I think with this, as I said, new analytics, the way we can measure different types of treatment interventions for various types of illnesses, I think we can get to models of care for specific types of illnesses or comorbidities, as they're known, mm -hmm. a combination of mental illness and addiction. I think we can find ways um, that work. And the key then is to make sure that we take those to scale, meaning we, we find them and then we bring them out so that treatment providers can know what tools are in their toolbox to help a patient recover. And, uh, and then we pay for those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think it's going to take some time, but one of the things I want us to do is do the kind, develop the common understanding. So, for example, we had tax season, you know, this last month. And when your IRS agent, you know, def defines whether you can deduct this or that or what's, uh, what, what uh, you fall under, mm -hmm. the fact is all of that's based upon a lot of tax code and tax law that your tax adjuster can't know all of it. So what they rely on are, are accepted, you know, interpretations of, yes. of the law. And what we need is to have developed that same set of common law or standards in understanding what is mental health so that we're not talking about everything under the sun, mm -hmm. but we're talking about those things that can be accepted as best practices and evidence-based medicine. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it has to be made uh, so that any person can go in and they can use those tools themselves, just like we have TurboTax nowadays. Now we have to take our last scheduled break. We'll be back after these commercial messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Mother's Day is coming soon. What gift do you want to receive? Drop a hint or treat yourself to refresh youthful eyes. Finally get rid of those bags and puffiness under your eyes. Introducing GenuCell Stem Cell Therapy for bags and puffiness under the eyes. Rosa from California wrote, I felt the bags under my eyes firm up and the skin was glowing. Your product helped me reduce puffiness immediately and in a couple of weeks I stopped using concealer because of the improvement. Actually, I've gone a week without applying heavy makeup. I would recommend to anyone I've noticed a great difference. And with its instant effects, you'll see GenuCell working in the first 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. 
Plus, for even younger and smoother skin, Chamonix will give you the legendary Esotique anti-wrinkle treatment absolutely free just for trying GenuCell today. Call 800-901-0636. That's 800-901-0636. Call this week and express shipping is also free with our Mother's Day promotion. That's 800-901-0636. Hi, I'm Pamela fugit hetrick the host of Money Moves. Cash flows and money moves, but do you find money moving out of your wallet faster than it comes in? Do you wish you had a personal money manager? Do your best Dirty Harry imitation. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Go ahead. Make my day. Pretend that your finger is your gun. Quick draw, aim, point, and straight ahead. Notice that one finger is pointing out, but you have at least three pointing back at you. You are the best person to manage your own money. To get the tools you need for the job, listen to Money Moves Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. As your host, I promise that each week, Money Moves will leave you with some tips and tools to help you manage your own money. Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Remember, that's Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Patrick Kennedy. Now, I can't let you go without asking you to speak about how your work in healthcare and personal experiences with addiction spilled over to becoming a co-founder of SAM, which stands for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Uh, you've taken a lot of heat from supporters for taking a stand against the legalization of marijuana. Is that right? Um, that's right, but... Uh... You know, uh, what I'm most concerned about is having a for-profit commercial industry, much like big tobacco, that has as their um, whole driving force trying to find people who are prospective addicts and who are dealing with mental health issues as their target audience. In other words... You're worried about predatory conditions. Well, of course, it's an addictive drug. Mm -hmm. It's a drug that, um, you know, alters your mind. And, you know, the people that will, you know, abuse it the most are are often people who are, you know, have high anxiety issues or uh, depression issues. And and frankly, you know, it's not a good thing when you want to, you know, try to address those issues. And it's often mistaken as some type of medicine. And frankly... Um, you know, I just, you know, worry about what kind of uh, future that holds, especially since so many people are going to end up using it if it's widely available are young people, just like the tobacco companies targeted kids because it's their future market. I really worry that uh, a commercial um, marijuana tobacco industry will also uh, target young people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what does Sam advocate as an alternative? So uh, I was a big uh, sponsor of the uh, not only the parity law, which treats these as, as uh, you know, early intervention, try to find people who are at risk for this, but mm-hmm. also I was a sponsor of uh, drug courts and mental health courts. So um, if you were, um, you know, charged with a drug-related crime, you had an opportunity for expungement um, if you uh, need a treatment or uh, you had alternative um, sentencing. Um, I think that we don't necessarily want to have this legalized because I don't think it's something that an a in- industry will really be responsible um, to, to doing the right thing in terms of the public health if it is commercialized. Um, however, I, I too share a lot of people's concerns that the drug war has incarcerated too many Americans who simply have uh, an addiction issue or a mental health issue. And I think that we can um, reform our criminal justice system in in dramatic ways without legalizing and and commercializing a drug that's also going to get many people into, into trouble. 
So are you recommending something like traffic school, for example? You, if you do commit an offense, uh, then you, have a, you go to an alternative court and uh, you have an uh, ability to get educated, uh, seek some treatment, and have the record expunged. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody is really interested in, um, you know, incarcerating people for low-level offenses. I think that what we want, though, is we don't want to make this a commercial product. So um, I do think this is going to require some debate. But one thing I do know is we need to track the experience of, you know, Colorado right now, which is at the forefront of this, along with Washington State. And frankly, in California, you've had your own experiences mm-hmm. um, with medical marijuana and the, and the diversion of marijuana to young people and, and in general to everybody else. Um, you know, I think there's this new thing called edibles. In other words, most people don't know about this thing that marijuana can come in the form of, of candy. It can come in the form of, of soda. Uh, It can can come in the form of other edible products. And we're seeing a higher and higher rate of uh, poison control reports of of children, you know, getting this stuff because they're over at their friend's house and no one knows that it's, you know, marijuana laced uh, candies. And I'm really not making this up. I mean, this is uh, this is going to be a really public health issue. Um, you know, there was a big problem with lead poisoning amongst our children years ago because it interrupts the uh, cognitive development of people, the developing brain. If you've had uh, ingested lead, you know, there's lead paint and all the rest. Well, you know, equally detrimental to your cognitive development is THC in, in your brain. So there's, there have been longitudinal studies in, in other countries like New Zealand. And... Um, and that was of a potency that is really much smaller than the potency of today's marijuana. The, the today's marijuana is so much more powerful than the marijuana that was tested years ago on developing um, people and developing brains. And they found that even after you stop marijuana in your 20s, if you were a kind of a regular user in your teenage years, that the, the loss in IQ stayed with you throughout your life. So Obviously, I just don't think these things are things that we can look at and think that um, creating a whole new industry where there will be lobbying interest to keep this accessible and profitable for the industry, much like the alcohol industry markets to kids, you know, flavored drinks, uh, you know, hard iced tea, you know, you're actually seeing uh, cable networks advertise on TV, hard liquor, Um, I mean, I just don't think that we want to repeat the experience of big tobacco and and, and big alcohol in a new kind of sanctioned um, drug in in marijuana. I think the combination of this is just not good for the future of our country. That's all. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly seem to be bucking the trend as states loosen their laws and they seem to be moving towards some forms of legalization, uh, which, by the way, mostly seems to be motivated by the need for tax revenues uh, in these states by, you know, I mean, I think that's motivating it just as well as anything else. Um, That is all the time that we've got this hour. I I wish I could keep you on for several hours to talk about this important subject. But before we say goodbye, I do want to uh, thank you for your advocacy and your service to our country. Thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. No, my pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Patrick Kennedy today, you can drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also at our website at RebeccaCosta.com. Just click on the contact page and there's a box where you can leave your remarks um, and If you're struggling with mental illness or addiction, or you know someone who is, uh, please don't wait. Time is not on your side. Uh, It's far better to overreact than bury your head in the sand and hope and pray that the condition is going to go away by itself. The fact is, the longer the brain remains dysfunctional, the more it begins to adapt to that dysfunctional state. And, And that becomes the new normal for the brain. Uh, eventually it it has no impetus to return to a healthy state. So we have to give it a kickstart, so to speak, uh, to get it on the road to health again. Uh, And thankfully we have the technology and the means to do that. So please do not wait. Take action. That's 90% of any cure.
And speaking of the healthy things we can do for ourselves and, and those we love, please do take a moment to go to our website, RebeccaCosta.com, and, and have a look at our new bookstore, where we've curated books designed to offer radical new ways to look at and solve some of the toughest problems we face in the world today. You'll find the books that we've chosen to be provocative and smart, uh, enlightening, and, and a lot of fun. And the best news of all is that when you click on any book, any book at all, it'll take you right over to Amazon. And once you're on the Amazon site, everything you purchase, whether it's a different book, a toaster, a DVD, anything, triggers Amazon to make a donation to the Costa Report. So please, the next time you want to make a purchase on Amazon, don't go direct. Go to RebeccaCosta.com first. Click on any book on our bookstore and it'll get you right to Amazon. Uh, go indirectly because you'll be keeping excellent programs like the one you heard today on the air by making a free donation to the Costa Report. I want to just end with one final comment about the courage that I think it takes any individual in public office to come forward, whether uh, they're forced into that position or not. uh, I want to say that it takes great courage to admit our weaknesses. It takes great courage to admit our challenges, particularly when they're embarrassing uh, and when they uh, come with them a great stigma. And uh, I think that speaks to character. Uh, I know some of you would say, hey, I don't want to elect someone who was arrested for a DWI. But uh, we have to make a decision in this country. We want honesty uh, or we want secrets. And uh, I vote for honesty. My guest next week served as the first White House press secretary for President Obama. Mr. Robert Gibbs will be joining us. 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 33 out of 100 Senate seats are up for grabs this November. So what does Gibbs know that the rest of us should? Find out next week when Robert Gibbs joins us right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. 